What are the biggest storylines for the Indiana Pacers heading into next season? They're running it back, but still a ton of important stuff to talk about with Benedict Mather and Jairus Walker. Can Tyrese Halberton be better? What else on this team is going to matter? Dustin Dopierre from the Indy Star and I break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Friday and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, the man who covers the Pacers for the Indy Star, Dustin Dopirak, is going to join us to break down the biggest storylines for this Pacers team heading into next season. A lot of Matherin talk. A lot of Jairus Walker talk, a lot of Tyrese Halburn and Pascal Siakam talk. Can this team get better? How will they be better? What's the future at the center position? Deep dives into all of those important questions with a twist this year, because Dustin and I did this last year. We actually reviewed our biggest storylines from last year. How'd the Pacers do? Did we get that right? Did we get that wrong? Man, did we look dumb talking about some of the Pacers' defensive additions from last summer in 2023, but we got it better today, I bet. Dustin Dopirak and I on the biggest Pacers storylines. Let's go. Let's talk some storylines. Big season for the Pacers. How do you follow up an Eastern Conference Finals berth? Maybe that alone is the big storyline for the Pacers, but they're trying to win exclusively as their goal for the first time in maybe five, six years, and that is is where the season will be graded. And there's a lot of little stories along the way. And joining me to break these down, the guy who did storylines with me last year. And again, every time we do this is like the longest gap between me seeing you of the year. It's yes. Dustin Dopirak from the Indie Star. Are you okay? How are you? I normally don't even have to ask you this because I just know the answer. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm I'm fine, Tony. Nothing's changed in two weeks except <laughs> the the time I missed practice we were just talking about because my my, <sighs> my house alarm went off. But that's good. Everything's good, but yeah, it's it's. I, I don't know how how do we how do we survive when we don't see each other for two full weeks? Usually, last we don't go year, thirty six hours. Last year at this time, we were covering lots of lottery pick stuff, lots of mm. Bruce Brown, lots of all that. Very different summer this year for the Pacers with a very different upcoming season. So this last year, we just ran through the storylines, and they there were many. Uh, mm. This year is a little different, and what I'm going to do this month with a couple other people too is look back at what we said last year would be the biggest storylines. And was that actually the case? Mm. And a lot of stuff, I did something with Jimmy Cook that required me to do this too. A lot of stuff that people, including me, including you, including probably the Pacers themselves, got wrong is the blend of how much last year would be about development and clarity with young players versus winning. That Mm. scale tipped way more towards winning games than Mm. many people realized it would and that's mm-hmm. because of some of the stuff that we talked about in the storylines perspective the very one of the very first things i said was we don't know who's going to be on the next great pacers playoff team well it was that team it was yeah. it was, it was that <laughs> roster for example yeah, almost everybody mm-hmm. yeah almost yeah. all of them outside of jordan war and bruce brown which and buddy, and buddy healed yeah and, oh and buddy healed yes and we recorded that like three days before this stuff came out about extensions with him, which became a big dominant storyline. But the thing we opened with and spent the most time on that I want to briefly cover before we look forward is we talked a lot about Ben Matherin on, in two <clears> different contexts. One was coming off a rookie year where he was first team all rookie and got to the line like a gazillion times and was a 16 points per game score was what is next on that growth path. And the second part of that was what does his fit with Tyrese Halberton come to be this year? <clears throat> And for various reasons, his own injury, Halliburton's injury, and the fact that he didn't end up clicking as much with Halliburton as Andrew Nemhart did, we didn't get a ton of information on that front where Mm -hmm. 840 minutes with Matherin, no Halliburton, 1,500 minutes with Halliburton, no Matherin, and only 700 with both of them last season. So that thing that we thought would be this massive storyline, it still kind of is. We'll talk about Mather and a sure. pretty good amount today, I'd imagine. But that mm-hmm. was kind of funny to look back on as, oh, for this team that's kind of trying to win and develop, this is very important. And it, it was, but not nearly mm-hmm. as much as we thought, which I thought was very interesting. Right. 
Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Because I mean, obviously, a lot of things change within that to, to move that sort of piece around. You know, they you know, he started early. You know, they obviously changed the lineup uh, later to make it more defensive oriented, and really, that was the point where you started to see him sort of drift more into being back to being a second unit guy. I think it, they, I think he'd moved back by that point, um, but that became sort of exclusively where his role was, and they didn't really try to push him back there. You know, he, he obviously, as you mentioned, he did have his, his minutes there together, and I think it, it still is a storyline because. Uh, you know, whether he's starting or not, he's still they still have to be able to play together. I mean, it still can't be a totally separate team when Halliburton's off on the floor versus when Matherin's on the floor and just try to, uh, you know, make it work that way. I mean, I, I guess it could, but I, I don't know that um, I, I don't know that that makes a lot of sense for them long term, especially when they have to decide um, basically by next summer whether they're going to extend him and, you know, extending him probably means uh, getting yourself really deep uh, into, you know, get, getting yourself probably into first apron territory uh, at that point, depending on who else you're, you're letting walk. I mean, you still have to make these big decisions to determine how they gel together. And there was, I think, some level of progress there. At least it seems like they've, they've communicated the message into what he's supposed to be when he's out there with Halliburton. Uh, whether he's going to do that or not uh, or, or be successful at is another question. But it seems clear they want him to be a guy who shoots or passes quickly, like whatever he's going to do, make decisions quickly within the system. You know, don't you know, basically get yourself in situations where you're spending a lot of time in ISO and, and slowing the ball down. Uh, continue to move the basketball, whether that's taking the shot that's available or making the pass that's available. That seems to be what they want. Is, is Are they going to be able to pull that off? Uh, you know, is kind of the bigger question. I, I think what's changed is it's not the question that defines whether or not the Pacers will be successful. I mean, exactly. I feel like they have a higher ceiling if he is what they want him to be, but if it doesn't work, they can be successful and win um, if, if he's not in the cards, basically. I, I think they have a much higher higher ceiling if they have him. Um, he, you know, but basically like they, I think that gives them the possibility of taking the next step of being a team that um, really can compete for an Eastern championship and an NBA championship. Uh, but if it doesn't work out, they're still a playoff team. You know, uh, that they, they, did, they didn't have him and they were still a team that could make an Eastern Conference Finals, albeit against an injury riddled, you know, side of the bracket. Um, but all the same, they got there. They have their second superstar caliber player in Pascal Siakam locked up for four years. Um, you know, they don't need Matherin to be that guy. You're, you're looking for Matherin to be your third guy. Um, you know, maybe he can he can rise above Pascal if Pascal sort of drifts as he ages. Um, but you you don't like it's not like that's your second guy or you don't have one you already have one in the fold and it's, it's about being able to bolster what you do have yeah the the you nailed it with the defensive pivot because i think they did get better together not a lot but a little bit um they actually mm -hmm. played more together during matherin's rookie rookie season which i, I believe think is, yeah sure which mm -hmm. from a minutes per or from a yeah from a minutes perspective fascinating the team uh, got better offensively with the pairing out there, but worse defensively, which tracks if you watch yes. them. And the reason they ended up not starting him anymore was defensive, which mm. is funny because one of your other biggest storylines that you hammered all season and you were right about, and it led to them making a lot of lineup changes, was their best defensive group and best offensive group had like no overlap at all, right? So how do you... Almost not. Your... I think we said Miles Turner is the only guy. Mm. If you started your best you five... You said exactly players. that. Yes. Yeah, that's what I said. Mm. Your best uh, five offensive players and your best five defensive players. The only guy who would start for both teams is Miles Turner. You know, and so with, with if Matherin is going to pair with these guys more often, and you're right, like he's not going to play so little that he's only playing when Halbert is not in the game. It mm. might be all about defense because he, right. I, like he, he won't have the ball as much, especially when it's with Siakam and Halberton, But he'll have the ball. He's good with the ball. So mm. defense will be a big thing there. Uh, okay, let's let's take uh, let's take some L's. <laughs> <along the way. laughs> <laughs> we were right about that. We talked about Buddy Heald trades a little bit. Um, okay. We talked up this one made me laugh. We talked about clarity with young guys. We said, who is good and who isn't among this group? Aaron mm. Neesmith, Obi Toppin, and Andrew Nemhard. How about all three? All right. Yeah. That, that was a big <laughs> part of them making the conference finals is mm. wondering about clarity with those guys. And they all turned out to be good. The thing you said that made me laugh the most in retrospect was we were looking – talking about their defense and can they get to like 20th on the defensive yeah. end? You said they added, and I agreed with you. They added mm. some defensive pieces this summer in Bruce Brown and Jarris Walker and Bruce Brown did not impact their defense nearly as much as anybody thought. And Jarris didn't play 
So they right. still have this this story, and they they couldn't financially address that issue as much this offseason. They still have the issue about addressing their defense and trying to get even close to 20th. And they found some solutions along the way last year that got them out of like the basement of the league. But that mm-hmm. made me laugh in retrospect uh, before mm-hmm. you got to the fact that their overlapping of good offense and good defense had no overlap. And that's why that's the case. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, what they – where they're in a weird position, like you mentioned, and not having been able to address it, is they did determine who the guys that they want on the floor for defense are. And that's Andrew Nemhard and Aaron Neesmith, and that yep. was the case the year before, too. Um, but I think you were looking at it, you know, having the fact that they went out and got Bruce Brown, they drafted Jairus Walker. It was, it, it was sort of an indication of, well, we have to have guys that are better than that. You know, like that, that can't be it. Um, but it is apparently going to be it. Those are the guys that are going to drive the train, um, you know, defensively for this team if they're going to get better. And they are good defenders, but I, mean, I think they were sort of hoping that there would be a, a, a depth of guys they could really trust to take on top assignments, that Jairus Walker would become that kind of guy and, and, and at least become an impact defender quickly. Um, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen ever. Um, but you know, Walker, I, to, to steal, I, to eternally credit Caitlin Cooper's line for this, um, because she's just spot on every time she says it is like his, his defense in theory is not where, you know, his defense in reality is not where it is in theory, uh, I guess, or in practice, I think it's the reality of this way she puts it, um, you know, he has the body, uh, you know, even more like we often say that Matherin has the body, but Walker really has the body. Walker really has the physical tools that you should you, you look at and say, that's what you should need to be a really good defender uh, in the NBA in, in 2020, you know, 2024. You know, a lot of length, a lot of muscle, good lateral quickness, all those kinds of things just doesn't quite get it yet. You know, uh, I guess is the simple way of putting it. Still wants to go after steal, still wants to gamble a little bit. He did cut that down, as Rick Carlisle pointed out to me more than a few times. Um, But he still, I I think uh, another thing Caitlin said was he still defends with his hands too much. You know, it's not his legs keeping, you know, just keeping him square and keeping him in front of somebody. He's always gambling a little bit. He's always getting his hands in there and trying to do something. And so he's not quite there yet. So right now, at this point, the guys that you can trust that you really believe in are still Nemhard and Neesmith, just as they were coming into last season. Um, and, you know, unlike last year when they went out and got Bruce Brown, they didn't get anybody else that, 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 that you know, to, to push that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, Wiseman obviously is helpful as a third center. I, I think Pascal Siakam was an impact guy defensively, even though I don't think he was a great individual defender necessarily. I think the length that he brings, the matchups that he can take on, make them better on a whole defensively, even though I don't look at him and say, man, he's doing a great job. Like I, I think his ability to come out and help and sort of show hands and everything uh, makes a difference. No, I, I think they've got a better defensive mindset. I think their belief in picking up 94 feet has made them better. But um, again, I just don't, they, they don't have all the parts of a great defensive team yet. And like you said, they weren't able to really address that. This episode is sponsored Buy BetterHelp when your schedule is packed with activities, kids' activities, big work projects, and plenty more. It's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when you know what makes you happy, it's hard to find time for it. But when you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. Therapy can be helpful for anybody for a variety of reasons, like learning positive coping skills, setting boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just for people who have experienced major trauma. If you have been thinking about starting therapy, Give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockdownNBA. You were right, though. They did add a guard who can defend, and they did draft someone who can defend last year. Just so happens that that was the same player. It was Ben Shepard. It was not Jarrett Walker yes. or Bruce Brown. So maybe he's someone they can kind of trust. The other thing we talked about that was funny yeah. is what, how Tyrese Halliburton, could he or could he not be better after that FIBA game? Is he ready to carry the mantle of a franchise? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. he was. That we got right. So I think we batted about 65 70%. That's okay. Not bad. I'll take they, that. I'll and I, you know that. who else batted about that percentage? Everyone, because their over-under was like 37 and a half last year, and they won 47 games and made the conference finals. But this mm-hmm. year, the expectations are different. And that defines a lot of, to me, 
their storylines for this season. And I'm actually going to lead with one, Dustin, that mm -hmm. we just talked about talking about last year, ironically. Mm -hmm. That's clarity with young guys. It's still yeah. a thing. It's sure. different now than it was mm -hmm. last year. But you nailed it. Like, Mather and Extension eligible next year. And there is a clock with their finances to figure mm -hmm. out who is and isn't the rest of their core. Last year it was like, okay, Halburn for sure. And probably Miles, and then eh, we'll see. And now mm -hmm. it's like, okay, Nemhard for sure, Neesmith for sure, Siakam for sure, Turner for sure, if they can keep him financial. Like they have a lot more locked in stuff. So right. now it's the rest of that young pieces who does and doesn't fit in. Isaiah Jackson, Jarris mm -hmm. Walker, Ben Matherin, even guys who, Ben Shepard, guys who he probably is, guys who might even be below them, like Wiseman or Furphy, right? Wh right? Who of them prove that, like, yes. This thing mm. matters to the next Pacers team because now mm. it's not about do you fit or not. It's you are more likely to be included in a trade for a great player at some point if you are not in that group. And so that is where the clarity else, the clarity this year, ironically, is still a thing because they, mm. if, if one of them could be a dude, that obviously would be huge. But in general, establishing that final pieces of your hierarchy is kind of a big thing to me this year. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it, it, it's just, it's still wild to consider. I mean, that, that they, um, entered a, a, a rebuild, uh, and, and, and we have this, obviously there's this sort of weird debate on Pacer Twitter as, as to whether it counts as a full rebuild. Um, yes, or, it was right. I, I think to me, it qualifies other people were like, I guess you're supposed to tank for four or five years and get the number, you know, get a top five pick. Um, but you know, they got two lottery picks out of that, um, whatever, you know, like, I, I guess a one year tank, a second year sort of late, um, I don't know what you would say what they did in the last 10 games or so of, of uh, 2023, 20, 20, or uh, you and 20, I were almost getting on the floor during those games. So it was, was that, yeah, exactly. Cause basically they were like, anybody who can play needs to go. I think what, what was, what was TJ? Oh my God. What was Carlisle's word for what TJ McConnell brings? And then the next day he was out and we said, he's out with tenacity. I think it was like, he's out with competitive tenacity or something along those lines. Um, that it just like, okay, he, re, they, they, they were, I got to see George Hill hit a half court shot because of that stretch. Yes, so at least exactly. that was exciting. Uh, they were, they were trying anybody who was showing any glimpses of wanting <laughs> to do anything. Well, they're like, you can't play anymore. Get out of here. Um, but you know, they, they have two lottery picks, you know, they, they it, like it had been, um, what 30 years more than yeah. 30 years uh, darn near 35 um since they'd had a pick in the top nine and they have two of them and right now you know despite the fact they were in a full rebuild you can't say whether or not those guys are long-term pieces for this group they believe in them they speak well of them um and and i, th I think I'll, I'll, often when we, we talk about them we act as if they are you know have, have the, the organization has reached a level of disappointment i certainly wouldn't go that far with mather and or with walker uh, at this point i mean there was a reason why they didn't get rid of walker um because you know when they had the opportunity uh and and we're looking to get the siakam deal done you know they, they by all accounts you know sort of drew the line at we're not giving we're not giving up walker we still we want this guy we want him bad but we're not ready to, to part from this guy from jared's walker yet um but it is a question of well, where do they fit you know and and do they fit at all uh basically and, and certainly do they fit enough i think matherin fits matherin's going to play for this team but it's just a question of next year when you're talking big big you know like whether or not you're going to give him big big money you know is is that going to happen that's the, you know and so walker it's just does he get any more minutes this year? You know, I mean, there, like there's, there's not a clear area where we say, okay, well, he'll take his minutes or he'll take those. He can play more positions, but there's still somebody in front of him. I mean, like he can play the three or the four. Well, Matherin's still there um, and Obi Toppin's still there. And that's that's their second unit, guys, you know, on top of, you know, Neesmith starting at the three and, and Pascal Siakam starting at the four. Where is the line? Where is the area where he gets minutes? You know, basically, like how does it work out? Um, I think they're going to try to make it work uh, and and try to you know maybe run an eleven man rotation sometimes, but uh, they got to win games. They intend to win games. They're like they're not they're going to go in there and try to at least match what they did last year, if not take it a step further. Um, so they're not going to experiment enough to you know uh, just throw him in there and, and and make weird combinations just to get him on the floor. Uh, it's not a development year. They're not they're out of the exactly. development place. So you know. Uh, that, that still is, I think, an interesting question. Yeah, I th my take has always been: I think Jarris will play more this year, not because mm, he, I will, I do too, not but. because he's like vaulted up, but because mm. they don't have Bruce Brown, they don't have Jordan War, they don't have Buddy Hield, all the mm. guys that were like theoretically between him and playing last year are gone. So even though he's not 
air quotes, in the rotation. One right. injury to like anyone who plays. Maybe not a right. point guard, but anyone sure. else. He's in. He's got like a role. Good, go. So, well, even a point guard. Even even a point guard if you think about it because, you Nemhard know, goes with, down. Yeah. with the way Nemhard and Nemhard McConnell and, um, you know, Halliburton operate, it's basically like, you know, they, they are taking up space the one and the two. Um, right. you know, basically. So if, if one of any of the three goes down, it does ultimately shift a little bit and opens up a wing position. Um, you know, there will be movement that, that kind of shifts around, but you know, in that mix gets Walker an opportunity and, you know, I, I think they trust him as, I think they trust his offense anywhere. And that's the weird piece of this is, is, is like, he's an interesting, that Clippers game, you were at it in LA last year, will be seared in everyone's brain forever. Like they trusted yeah. him and he delivered in a major right. way on both ends that night, right? Like yeah. they do, they just do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's just not that he just doesn't have a clear path, but um, he's got talent that fits in a lot of places. I, I think you get, you saw it stand, stand out again in Summer League. Um, you know, he's, he's certainly, we talked about this a, a bunch. I, I say this way too much on Twitter, but man, did he get to be a better shooter? I mean, it's dramatic. Yeah how much of a better shooter he is. Uh, and oddly, I mean, he he seems way more comfortable handling the ball than uh, – it's almost like he he's in the most comfortable bringing the ball up and being face up to the rest of the floor. Like that's where he's at his most comfortable offensively is when the ball is in his hands. Um, and it's almost like playing out of the corner looks – almost a little bit different, you know, like less natural, like playing at a true three position, you know, a one or a two on offense almost makes the most sense for him. It's weird. Um, even though his body is, is, you know, it's best fit as a power forward. Uh, he looks perfectly comfortable handling the ball. So you're, you're, you're right. That basically anybody gets hurt at all. And remember in the course of 82, it, it doesn't need to be an ACL tear that, that and yes. somebody sees it couple of minutes it's a sprained ankle here you know a, a bum shoulder there a back spasm you know uh cold you know like a couple of bad days of a flu you know all of that uh gets you an opportunity uh to get on the to get on the floor um and so there's there are a lot of things that could happen that lead him get lead to him getting on the floor i actually want to check how many games all of their top 10 last year all played Right. <laughs> it's, it right. can't be very many, you know. Yeah. Like, there was crazy. always something small. I mean, yeah. there weren't too many debilitating injuries. Obviously, there was a Matherin shoulder. There was hamstring, uh, uh, Halliburton's hamstring. And on a whole, the guys were, you know, like if, if you look at total games, it's pretty good. I mean, Obi played 82. Uh, Siakam played, I think, all 41, yeah. uh, you know, once he was acquired. Miles Turner played 77. I mean, that's 15 more than he played in any of the previous four years. Uh, you know, Nemhard played a time. He, he missed some early, but, he was you know, early. pretty solid after that. Uh, you know, Neesmith only missed a handful, you know, but it was just – it's still – a shift, you know, there, there was still some moving apart. Bruce Brown missed some time. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the idea, like when they were all 10 together was different, but um, they, they did, they did better health wise than a lot of people. Have. A lot of other teams did. And that's something to monitor this year. Do you have a big storyline or would you like to me to just run through mine as we, I, I'm going to, well, I'm going to go with this one's obvious and, and I'll keep going, keep them going through. Uh, I'll have big storylines. I, mean, I, I again, I think some of them are obvious, but Tyrese Halliburton still another big storyline. I mean, it, Tyrese Halliburton yes. will always be a big storyline <laughs> with the team, regardless of what it is. But to define it as I see it, it's you know, last year was um, it, it was the best year of his career, but it was rocky in the sense that there was just he was dealing with constant change. Uh, you know, once he, once he got past um, you know really the in season tournament, um, that those first four, six weeks were like magic. Uh, and I think he even said that it, it feels like I'm just playing ball by myself and there's nobody out there. Um, and when that ended, it was over for the rest of the year. And he was still productive and he did a lot of things and he, he won them a lot of games. But there was always something, uh, you know, really, I think December required some adjustment. He got better towards the end of December, really that kind of Christmas period. He was sensational. Um, and then he gets the hamstring injury and, and it was, it was, it was always something to work through. First it was, you know, after the IST, it was like, okay, you're going to get blitzed all the time now. And they're going to pick you up full court and you have to learn to play off the ball. And then, you know, and, and he started to kind of, kind of have that figured out and then he hit the hamstring injury and then he came back, you know, and then he was out again. And then it was the minutes restriction. And then it's like, Oh, we're trading buddy. And now you have to figure out uh, how to be the best shooter on the team and the creator. 
Um, and then he went through a shooting slump and it was just like, there was always something he had to adjust to. And so the question is going to be, is, is that, is this year going to be similar? How has he learned from the things that he did have to adjust to, uh, you know, in terms of just dealing with opposing defenses, be doing the on the ball, off the ball thing, uh, you know, ha having that kind of synergy with, with Nemhard of each of them kind of being the primary ball handler and the secondary, you know, what's that look like? Um, how does that adjust? And again, you know, also, is he healthy? Uh, you know, will, you know, he, he did, he did have some time to rest, but then he did have to come back and play in the Olympics. He's not getting a ton of minutes, but he's out there. He's doing stuff. I mean, to, to what degree is he fully rested? Uh, is, is it going to be fine? Um, and also, is he going to be able to, you know, have get some upper body physical transformation? Because, you know, um, there's a reason why he's not getting those minutes. And it's because they went and went out and got a better defender uh, in Derek White. And so, you know, that's, that's, I, I don't know that, in, in a, a few isolated spots, it's been rough. The, he's had some moments where he hasn't looked good defensively. Um, you know, he he has, as, as we've, we've noted a ton of times, he's got phenomenal basketball IQ, and that makes him a really good off-the-ball guy, getting getting his hands on pass, passing lanes and stuff like that. But he's not locking anybody down at this point. He's not keeping anybody who really wants to drive on him in front of him. He's gotten pushed around um, in, in some of these Olympic situations. He's, he, guys have just taken it to him. Um, and, you know, he's got to get better, you know, at, at some point in time. And so it's sort of, you know, and it's going to require physical transformation. Uh, and will he be able to do any of that this summer? Uh, again, no matter what, he's better off being in this event. Like, I mean, I, I would, if, for as much as a lot of people talked about, maybe he should skip it. Um, this is, you know, once in a lifetime opportunities, memories, you know, even if he plays 20 minutes, this whole entire tournament, it's still worth it for him to be out there. Um, but there is going to be a, a price as far as what it costs him um, in terms of weight room time and all that kind of stuff and, and, and time that could be spent, you know, kind of making himself just bigger and faster and stronger and more capable of, of dealing with what he's going to have to do on the defensive end. Yeah, you play your whole life for this opportunity. You do. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> never in a million years would I suggest he should not go to this. People yeah. ask me, do you think he's going to skip it? I was like, God, no. No. And God, you no. can see just the joy on his face. I mean, even when he's not playing, I mean, he is loving this, you know, and, and like the basketball fan, the little kid. And Braun, in it's Braun, his favorite player. It is exactly. He's watching Braun at 39 doing yeah. absurd things, doing incredible things. And it's like, man, like, I got a front seat to this and I just got to work out in practice. Like how I could never pass this up. Like you can sense that in Tyrese that it's like, no matter how annoyed he might be that he's not getting the minutes that, that like, he's like, man, you got to enjoy this. Like you have to, you don't, you know, not too many people get to be there. And, you know, they'll ask him about this 20 years from now in some documentary and they'll, you know, do it on LeBron's last ride. Um, and he'll be in that. And, and again, like if they win gold, he gets a gold medal. Like you don't, not too many people get that opportunity. And so it's like, he, he could not in a million years skip this. But like I said, I mean, there, there just will be a price to pay for that. And if he gets a gold, the uh, I'm tired of being a loser quote can retire for finally a disappear. Yeah, yes. He will get mm -hmm. On, ironically, like the Derek White playing thing, I think it's the right choice. But, I do too. Yeah. And, and it's some of it is the defensive stuff you said, but some of it too is the other thing we've talked about. But he's really good off the ball on it, too, with a lot of ball dominant dudes. And so, sure. like both of the things that Halliburton defensively, majorly, and off the ball minorly for the Pacers getting better at, because I would allow Siakam, even to a lesser extent, Matherin and, and mm -hmm. Nemhard to have the ball more, like that would be huge if he got better at those things, right? So, right. taking that mm -hmm. home from France. Yeah, be major, even if he's not playing that much, or he's the sure. you know the human white flag at this the best human white flag of all time. Uh, <laughs> it's Iris Oliver. Human victory cigar. Human white flag means you're losing. Oh, that's true. That's true. You know, he that's is, he is signaling to the other team to to put up. Yes, this. Yeah, uh, a a suggestion of you can wave the white flag. Now. Yes, yes, yes. Like it's uh, like when guys hit a huge shot and they signal to the other team to call a timeout. That's kind of what. Yeah, that's kind of what saying. it is. It's like it's it's over, guys. You can you can call it. One more break here, guys. We got to talk about the lovely folks over at FanDuel. I love sports. I love sport, sports so much. I never wanted to stop. I've been soaking up the Olympics like crazy. But with the NBA done and the NHL done, there's fewer games in the summer. We got the MLB in the Olympics right now. Women's basketball off until the Olympics are over. The sports are not sporting like we all want right now. But thankfully, FanDuel lets us keep the sports going whenever we want. All we have to do, open up the app and dream up bets anytime. You're in the mood this summer, all summer long, still a month and a half of the summer calendar. FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus every 
single day. That's right. There's something for everybody every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. That's on FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, I have a I have a fun one, and mm. you were there when he said this, and this 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 made me think in a way that I hadn't thought of before. So so Pascal Siakam signed a very big contract, Dustin, um, mm. and everybody says, man, he's thirty, mm. he's gonna be thirty four at the end of this. How many years is he gonna be good about that? And I, I I don't want to talk about that part, although it is a potential storyline this season. Sure. What I want to talk about is something he said to us, which mm. is that he thinks he's going to be better <laughs> this year than right. last year. Because of you come over in this transition, and he's been in mm-hmm. Toronto, which specifically is important here because Nick Nurse runs very unique and challenging defenses a lot mm-hmm. with different terminology and different different yep. instincts is the key yep. word here. Like the things you have to react to and what you do when you react are way mm-hmm. different than you do for other teams. Yeah. So he came to the Pacers, and you talked about his defense a little bit. It was so different what he had to do instinctually and what is even his role was on that end of the floor and what he had. And I know I I said many times that I was kind of disappointed by his defensive level with the team, but he said to us, Hey, I think I can be better as a player. Mm -hmm. And he cited the defense first, but there's more to it than that. He has this gym in his house and he's grinded on all this offensive stuff too. And -hmm. he clearly adds a a unique dimension to the Pacers offense that makes him a major player for them. But I think a small, but yet still very important storyline to me this year. And like obviously running it back is about your young players getting better and then seeing mm-hmm. what you can do from there. But a big part of the Pacers potentially being better this season is can Pascal Siakam actually be better. Is he right when he says that to us? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think he is. Uh, I, I think, I mean, just the, um, just the fact like he's going to have a camp with these guys. Like I, I think yeah. he, there, there is so much there's more opportunity for, for him to fully buy in. Um, and not that he wasn't fully bought in. I think he fully bought into everything. But it's just there's time to work on stuff. I mean, it's it just when you're in a situation like he was in, like you're just everything is on the fly. And you go, you know, like you you go weeks without, you know, practices where you can go five on oh. Um, and, and I think, you know, Halliburton would mention that it's like, you know, we haven't gone five on O yet just to kind of rework our, this is where you're supposed to be. This is where you go, you know, like that sort of thing. Um, and they had to just pick so much up on, on the fly and, you know, uh, he, he gets there and Halliburton gets back for that game and then he's out for another five. And then he's on a minutes restriction after that. And so Siakam has to become one guy while Halliburton's off the floor and then he has to become another guy when he's on a minutes restriction and then you have the all-star break and then, you know, it, it has to change again where Halliburton becomes, you know, the more important player, you know, he spends time with Matherin, Matherin gets hurt. Um, there was just a constant change and he just, he just had to hang with that. And, and, and I thought he was excellent, you know, and he has the skill set that allows him to be productive, even if he doesn't have a, a like, uh, a total understanding of, of, of what everybody wants him to do. Um, but cause it's just like, all right, well just throw me the ball and I can go make a play. Uh, just trust me on that. Just, I will go, you know, post somebody up on, on the wing and, you know, I can hit a turnaround jumper or spin to the rim on him. And, you know, like that's something you don't have, you know, like, so, so give me those opportunities and I'll get you that and we'll figure this, the rest of it out as it goes along. And so they're just going to operate with much more, um, you know, synchronicity to start with, uh, that, that will be further along. And so I think offensively that'll be there. And, and like you said, I think, I, I don't think we understood until he really mentioned this to us, how much of a difference the defense part of it made, because I mean, they, they did kind of really switch up their principles and their sort of priorities, uh, defensively in terms of, okay, what, what shots do we want the other guy to take? You know, right. at, at, at the end of the day, I think that was really the biggest thing of saying, okay, like we're there, their view was okay. Like you're not letting them get threes, but you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just trying to force them into long twos. You're playing two on two out of pick and roll, you know, like you're not necessarily tagging here, running over there. And it's just, all right, being used to one idea and one list of defensive principles and then having getting, having to get used to another, you know, was a serious adjustment. And, you know, I, I think it matters for a guy like Siakam because I mean, I, I, I think I probably assumed him to be a better, just one-on-one defender than he is. Um, I think he's, but he, I think he has capacity to be a, a better team defender. Um, and that, those, that stuff matters when you're talking about it that way. I mean, I think he still had a big impact in terms of, you know, when he would switch on guys and just come over, bring length at somebody at just the right time. Uh, you know, I, I think he, he had some really good moments there. And I think there's, there's a capacity for more. It's just, he's not necessarily, 
you know, um, if, if he guards Giannis, you know, is he going to lock down Giannis? Is he going to, you know, um, uh, just turn a guy that can score 64 against these guys into a guy that's only scoring 20? You know, probably not. Uh, I, I don't necessarily view him as that kind of force defensively, but he's able to sort of run around and, you know, get real big and, and basically like alter shots, you know, uh, alter passes, you know, just sort of bottle guys up necessarily. Like if, if you go right at him one-on-one, -on -one, you might beat him. Um, but he, he, I think can be really have a big effect and did have a big effect of just being a guy who runs around and is the right place at the right time um, and use that like to his advantage. And so I think that's what he'll be better at when he has a better understanding of the system. He doesn't suck guarding fives. So in their right. starting five, they can switch more when he's out there, which is nice. And, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this a lot during the season. But, like, to me, his biggest impact last year was, even when he didn't instinctively know their defense was, him playing the four meant that Neesmith mm -hmm. was not guarding a four. Or the infamous, right. our best upside, Larry Markkinen, is who tonight? <laughs> who are we? Right. What? Yes. <laughs> you know, oh, my God. Those God. games don't happen anymore. And that so was that brutal. was his biggest thing. So now if he's yeah. actually like, oh, I get this. Like, this is natural and instinctive to me. That will go a long way. The other part of can Pascal Siakam be better is last year, Siakam on Halbert off Pacers offense, unbelievable. 126.8 offensive rating. Very good. Halbert mm -hmm. on Siakam off 127. Like that's amazing. With both of them, it was a measly. This would still be like the third best offense in the NBA. 116 or one, excuse me, 118.7. So I am mm -hmm. imagining that number will get better. Now, yeah. here's the other thing. There's a chance Pascal Siakam gets worse. <laughs> that, that is undeniably mm -hmm. true. He is 30. Like that, that is a fact sure. of of life for basketball players. I don't know what is, is going to happen with him, but a storyline to me, especially if the Pacers are trying to win under the premise of them winning and their future is, can he be better? And I think he can be. You're next. If you have another one, I have one more big one, uh, I, but I'll let you go next. I, I do have another one. I think the, uh, ha the evolution of Andrew Nemhard, what will it be? Exactly. It just, yes. you know, I think the you saw just saw a capacity and and certainly you'd seen him in in sort of small doses when Halliburton was out, um, you know, being an offensive force. Obviously, when when he got to be the lead guard, you know, going going back to the Golden State game um, in 2022, you know, December of 2022. Uh, I think the Milwaukee game, you know, late in the year, you know, when Halliburton was also out, I think he had 26 in in that win. You know, you saw his ability to score in bunches on on occasion, um, but. The aggression that he showed in the playoffs, you know, certainly the, the last two games, Halliburton was out when he had 32 and 26, but just all in all, like he was just way more aggressive looking for a shot and, you know, aggressive looking for opportunities to cut, just put himself in a position to, to score the basketball. And it's sort of like, like what, what does he become? How do they sort of view him as a weapon? Um, and I, I think that's kind of a, a, the big question for me is what does that look like? Um, you know, it, it, it seemed like, especially early on when they, they try to get him the ball more so that Halliburton could play off the ball. It seemed like, okay, like your job, Andrew, is to is to keep the ball moving and, and make sure it finds Tyrese again eventually. Um, but they got to the playoffs and it was like, okay, like you're probably going to have an advantage, you know, with your matchup. They're probably not going to be concerned about you. So take advantage of that. And it seemed like by game two, game three of the Milwaukee series, it was, all right, Andrew Nemhard's going to be a factor here. And that was the case for the rest of the playoffs. And so it's like, what does that look like going forward? I mean, he's just, he's not your natural big high scoring two guard. You know, he's not going to wake up tomorrow and be Anthony Edwards. Um, but what is he, you know, basically what, what, how do you make the most of that? Cause the guy can hit shots. The guy can finish. Um, you know, he has a lot of, it, just a lot of scoring talent. Um, and still you do have to make sure that, you know, the, like there's only one ball, you know, Miles Turner has got to get opportunities. Halliburton has got to get opportunities. Siakam has to get opportunities. Aaron Neesmith has to get opportunities. And so it's trying to make five guys happy and that's not easy. Um, uh, but he is a force and, uh, and, and you obviously saw that a little bit with Canada and, you know, that, that, that 19 point game, I can't remember who that was against now. Spain. Uh, Spain. He was excellent in that game. Amazing. He yeah. Fantastic. Hit so many big shots. Uh, played just phenomenal basketball. Like that's there. And now you're paying him. You know, like you're, you're signed up to pay him 59 million over three years. Uh, you know, he, he like if you're paying a guy that much, you probably and he can score for you. You probably shouldn't let him just average like seven or eight a game. You know, <laughs> let, let him score the basketball. Um, so what does that look like? How do they? you know, make that work really maximize uh, the Nemhard Halliburton pairing uh, and make sure they're not stepping on their toes, but they are enhancing each other. You know, what's that look like? And um, I, I, I'll, you know, I, I'm sure when we ask that question, you know, we won't get a, a, a super detailed answer because Rick won't really tell us, um, <laughs> but 
that I think is a long-term qu question to be very interested in. Because again, you you've now you've now devoted a lot of money for to, for these guys being your starting backcourt. You know, you've got a lot of money invested in those two, um, and you got to see how that works. And especially you know. E especially when you're going to make a decision about Matherin, um, you know, like you got to make sure this pairing works. You want to see if it also works with Ben Matherin, um, but these guys together have to have to work and you have to see how that goes. Yeah. We heard Shay describing his perfect player in that Phoebe mm -hmm. interview and they said, best passer. And he said, Andrew Nemhard. I was like, mm -hmm. Whoa. And yeah. so the, the big part of Nemhard to me this year is last year, sharing the floor with Tyrese Halburn, 5.7 five assists per 100 possessions for Andrew Nemhard. That's barely more than Siakam. That's like one more than Bruce Brown. Buddy Heald was at four, mm. right? Like that's not that far off of other guys. Without Halliburton, he was at 11.75 assists per 100 possessions. Huge jump. Uh, McConnell had a similar jump, but the thing is no one else on the team has that kind of difference. No one else is even close to those two guys in the Halliburton up. And it's like, he is a really good passer, like can have some sort of, of mm -hmm. gravity and, and creation ability. What, how does that blend with Tyrese Halliburton, right? Like, right. can that become more of a thing? And if you do points, it's a little different because other guys, you know, are also talented scorers in the way that isn't necessarily the case with Tyrese Halliburton. Mm -hmm. Engineer marked points per hundred possessions is 15.84 without it's 21. Point one, right? Like we know he can be awesome, like really good in certain moments and with the right lineups. Now can that be all the time with every lineup? He's not going to have the ball as much as Tyrus Albert, and he shouldn't. But that's right. a big part of his growth too is you just mm. played with Jamal Murray and Shea and looked really good in some of these games. Push that into this year in some way. What does that actually look like for him? Because I think there's no doubt he's really good and important. We saw that in the mm. final two conference finals games. What can that be with the best Pacers five there is? Because he's going to be in it because he can guard. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I think you're, you're not going to see a maximized version of Nemhard as long as he's playing with Halliburton. It's, but it's just a question of what's the best that they can get out of, him, you know, uh, because I just, it's just a situation where uh, Halliburton requires the ball uh, and the system is built around Halliburton. It's not built around Nemhard and Nemhard is a point guard by trade. And so he is, he is necessarily, as long as he's playing with Halliburton, uh, kind of playing left-handed, I guess, is the best is maybe the best way to put it. Uh, it's just it's he is going he is I mean he's sacrificing at the end of the day, and I think that's a, a good maybe the best way of putting it is um, he is saying okay I, I have this much to add to this like you're not you're not going to be able to get everything there is out of me because the best that you could get out of me is me running the offense me you know running the show. If Tyrese is going to run the show, like there's there's a, a certain port, port portion of him um, that, that that isn't there basically. But right. it's how what what can he be in a secondary role? Like what's what it, what is the way to best maximize the talent he has? You know, in that secondary role to make sure that you and he are getting as much as you can out of it. You, you're you're not going to get everything. Um, because everything means he is by nature a guy who is, you know, is a point guard. Um, but, you know, it, so what's the best that he can be uh, if he's running the two? Um, and, and again, just just how do you maximize that? How do you make that the best that it can be for Halliburton and for Nemhard? And so it's, it's a I'm sure it's very fluid, I guess. I mean, I think we've seen it, that it's very fluid and it will continue to be fluid. But it's like what kind of strides will they make in that regard? My final big storyline I already did an episode on, and yet the dynamics of it have changed. And that is primarily based on Miles Turner, but really a pole position. What the sure. hell is the future of center on the pitch, right. right? Every mm -hmm. other starter locked up for three, four years, backups at many of those spots locked up for multiple years. At center, it's Miles Turner is going to be guaranteed that can extend to be a free agent next summer. And they're already like, oh, can we keep? him and everybody else sir and then yeah. isaiah jackson's contract is expiring and james wiseman only could get five hundred thousand guaranteed dollars this year and maybe the pacers can develop another center there but uh they have like maybe no future centers on their team maybe they have all of them but that would require trading someone else away so it's it's really fascinating what if turner is not as good this year what if he's even better this year yeah. and his great front court he had a great very healthy season last year what does he feel like he owes the Pacers, if anything, after they renegotiated him? What do the Pacers feel like they owe him for 10 years of loyalty? He has mm -hmm. leverage in that he's an unrestricted free agent for a team that can't afford a replacement. They have leverage in that there's a kind of these apron lines that prevent them from paying him a certain amount. So I don't know what the future with him is. I don't know what the future of Wiseman and Jackson is. And that is a very important position for the Pacers. Yeah. They just have no idea what's coming.
It's massive. You know, it, it's huge in terms of just what their future is. And it, it and and like they're running up against this, but it's it seems like everybody wants it, you know, like it, it everybody wants to be able to continue the relationship. You know, it seems like Miles Turner is a hundred times happier than he was certainly when I got on the beat. Um, you know, like I, he's just since he signed yeah. that deal, he's a different guy. I mean, like he is so he seems so bought in. I mean, he is operating personally um, in terms of just how he talks, how he operates, even his social media presence. Like he's going to be in Indiana forever. Um, you know, after he he was you know right up to the point of being like, okay, like I'm obviously getting traded. Like he clearly wants to be a part of this, and from a pure basketball standpoint, he really really fits. You know, I mean, he, he really fits what they want to do offensively. Um, he's not as good of a shot blocker as he used to be, but he can still do it. Um, I, I think from, you know, if it's just if you were just talking about, is this a basketball fit? It's still a great basketball fit. It's just I mean, the money fit part of it is tough. And so so what does that look like? Is he willing to take less? But or, or, or what? I mean, like what what can he um, you know, what's what's he willing to push for? I, mean, I think he does. I don't think I don't. I, I think some of it's loyalty, but some of it is I think he just likes this. You know, I think he likes this team. He started to drop those hints last year of how much it's a part of him now. Like this yeah. team in City. Yeah, exactly. I, I think he knows that, you know, I mean, there would be opportunities someplace else, but I mean, I, I think he feels like he feels like he's built a lot of equity, um, you know, with uh, the team and with the city and with the guys. And, and he feels like he's a good fit for with, with Halliburton. He feels like he's a good fit with Halliburton and Siakam, that, that, that those three as a group fit well together, uh, that, that, that they they can play off of each other, obviously just in the basic kind of like pick and roll scenario, like Siakam and Turner can each go out there in space and create gravity and allow the, the other to be the, you know, ball screen guy for Halliburton and, and create things that way. And they can both score at three levels and create, you know, in the mid range and all, all that kind of stuff. Like that the, they, they each open up a lot of opportunities for the other. Um, and so I think he sees a lot of great growth potential for him basketball wise. It's just, it's it, the money is starting to get tight is, is really all it is. And it's a question of like, to your point, obviously if he comes back back and has a significantly worse performance than he did last year, um, you know, then maybe they're more willing to move on, but it's not going to be easy to get, you know, a, 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 a quality replacement. I, I think I generally say that I think he's exactly the 10th best center in the NBA. You know, somewhere in that vicinity, a tenth, eleventh, twelfth. You know, somewhere in that range. I don't think he's fifteenth, and he's definitely not fifth. Um, but you know, like I think he is in that pocket. Um, and it's not, you know, it's possible to replace that kind of guy, but it's not easy. You know, like Very you can't hard. guarantee that if you draft next year, you know, somewhere in the late twenties. I mean, I think they still have their twenty twenty five first round pick, right? Yep. Um, you know, like there's no guarantee you're getting a guy there uh, that you certainly can't trust that James Wiseman is going to be that guy, you know, Isaiah Jackson, you know, like wonderful as a person as he is, we're big fans of Isaiah, the, the dude. Um, but you know, like, is Isaiah ever going to be your, like, does, does he have the capacity to be your starting center? Yeah. I, I think he's just, he's going to be a really good backup for a really long time you know, or at least he can be because he's got the athleticism, you know, everything like that. But, you know, can you throw the ball in the middle to him and have him create? No, like you got to be like, he is a lob guy at the end of the day offensively. And so, you know, he is, he is a finisher. He's get up, you know, and, you know, get buckets that way, get, get stick backs, et cetera. He's not a guy that you can bring up in a high pick and roll and, you know, give him the ball at, at the elbow and he makes a play. Like that's, you know, Turner has that. And so it's like, that's not easy to replace. And so it's, they, it's almost like they have to find a way, but you know, like that, the, finding a way gets you deep into the first apron. If I'm Miles Turner, I walk into that negotiation room next year, and I'm holding a giant poster of DeAndre Ayton in my hand. <laughs> yes. Remember yes. this? Remember this? I think he did it. I think he did it for the entire last one. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, this happened. <laughs> yeah, K KP was pretty clear with us. I think when we were talking about that, he's like, "Yeah, that was mentioned more than once." <laughs> like. They were all. I about said it at his exit interview. He's like, man, they tried to sign another center. I was like, Ugh. yeah. Oh well, yeah. Is. No, I mean he that that will stick with him for a long time, and they are quite fortunate that didn't work out. I was gonna say no. they are exceedingly lucky. That, yes. that, that went very very lucky that they ended up with uh, with Miles Turner rather than DeAndre. Aiden. The final five sentence I would give for this season would be: Look, they have the same team running it back's great. That is what they should have done, which is why we asked about it at exit interviews. That mm -hmm. said, it is different when it's like. 
ooh, we're spunky and fun and better than people thought. And yeah. Like, hey, now people expect you to win. How mm. do you react to not? That has taken right. down a team or changed the dynamics of a team before. Mm -hmm. Tyrese Halberton has so far been excellent at mentally leading a team like this. This is now the first time he has also been on a team with that reality. How does he right. and the team push through that? We have already taken up too much of any of everybody's time, unless you have more to add on that. I do want to. I, I do want to agree on that. I, I think. I, I think it is big. I think you know Rick Carlisle was mentioned the idea of wanting uh, to have short memories uh, with this group and not really think about what happened. I, you know what the, the the point I think to bring up is it's it, it's at some point in in the course of a season. You know when you're coming out, like you will probably have a slump, and there is way more. I think feeling of tension when it happens yes. than when you're plucky, I think, uh, is that, that basically when, you know, I, I certainly kind of felt like with the 2022, 23 team, I mean, it was just a total joy ride, even though they didn't make the playoffs. Like that was like the happiest 35 and 47 team I've ever been around. Um, I, not that I, it was my first NBA team I was covering, but the happiest, what, what's that percentage wise, 45 like 40, or whatever, 45, yeah. 42, you know, uh, 420 winning team, uh, or whatever, uh, that I've been around and, and it, but it was just, it, there was awareness that they weren't supposed to be there and any success they had, um, was gravy and, and just the fact that they were showing that they were competitive meant that they were changing the trajectory pretty dramatically and they didn't have to do, get to the playoffs to do it um you know this group is going to start with the like okay well where you got last year um you know is the eastern conference finals and so you're going to be expected to win 50 games so what happens when you're not on pace for 50 you know i think that's going to be an interesting thing even if you lose two or three in a row it gets a little bit more tense in there it doesn't have to be a big long crazy losing streak for people to be like okay what's what's wrong here and you know again you are introducing a lot of money to this system you know uh and you know that mo almost everybody's taken care of for the most part you know every, everybody at least for the moment is getting paid pretty good i, I don't think anybody you know you could look at anybody in, at this point you know I, and, and i imagine they'll probably try to do some kind of extension for mcconnell um you know, no one's looking at it and saying, okay, well, I'm making way less than everybody here. Um, but still, you're adding money to this situation. And and so it, it just changes the dynamic. They're just in a different place than they have been. And it's very interesting to see how they're going to handle it. It will be. Uh, it, the year, the second year of Oladipo felt like that. And they actually were playing well mm -hmm. before he got hurt. But, you know, it's just, it's just different when you mm -hmm. come out of a year where you just blow by expectation. Dustin? This mm. was great. Can't wait to come back next year and go, why the hell did we talk about Jairus Walker for that long? And what were exactly we they were fine at center. Isaiah Jackson and James Wiseman are great. Everything yeah. will be fine. Exactly. Uh, we'll be doing that for years. We'll be talking about Jairus Walker as long as he is in a uniform. Yeah. That is for sure. Uh, oh, I, wow. I, I, I'm watching Steeple Chase. The guy just got took out. Oh, my Lord. Anyway. <laughs> um, wow. I have to turn off the Olympics to work. I can't stop watching it. It is. <laughs> it's it's phenomenal. It's amazing. I it's never watch these sports. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Like, why isn't this around? Why isn't this on TV around? I always yeah. say, say to people working people find you in your work. I'm sure most people listening know who you are. And where you <laughs> to go. I will still offer you the courtesy of doing those. Things. Well, I appreciate it. It is. It's, it's the Twitter handle you see there at Dustin DePirac. And of course, uh, at IndyStar.com. You can always find all of our Pacer stuff. For me and anybody else who writes about Pacers at any given point in the year. And, you know, we got Colts coming up and stuff like that. So if you're into that sort of thing, you know, check into my guys, Joel and uh, Nate as well. Uh, Sig is rolling at IU. New coach at Purdue also. I just met Nathan, so I have to include those people at the mm -hmm. star as well among their terrific sports staff. Longtime reader, mm -hmm. Tony East. will do the promotion for you. You don't have to do it, Dustin. I got it. Um, I Tomorrow, we'll see. I don't know what day this is actually coming out. So this is either Friday show, and if so, everybody enjoy your weekend. If this is Thursday show, tomorrow you're going to hear from Josh Lloyd and me looking ahead at this Pacer season. Dustin, thank you for the time. Everybody, thank you for listening. We'll see you mm -hmm. very soon.